Welcome to Launch Code, a premier business podcast, starring Evan Hafer, Matt Best, and Jared Taylor. All right, guys, this is Evan with Launch Code. Today, we've got a great guest, um, somebody that we met probably about a year ago now, I believe, right, Stephen? Something like that, yeah. Something yeah, like that. Not that long ago. Yeah. We yeah. ran into each other again at Clever Talks <laughs> down in uh, San Diego a few months ago. He had me on his podcast, uh, which we will get into. And now we're going to talk to you about what you do. So you get to put me on the hot seat. I'm going to put you on the hot seat. We're going to – really. <laughs> they're cold seats. They're cold <laughs> seats. Cold seats with warm butts. Um, there we go. Hey, so first and foremost, man, give us a couple uh, couple minutes on on your background, um, and then get in. We'll get into the the show, so you can talk about that as well. But uh, what's okay. what's your background, Stephen? Well, I'm from Pennsylvania, and uh-huh. I joined the army in 19, I joined the army in 1986. Uh, went to straight out of high school. Ten years later, ten days later, and took off from boot camp Fort Knox, and I went to went to Germany, and I stayed there until '93. And where I got out, well, I went to Iraq first desert storm, got right. out, stayed in Germany, stayed in Germany. And then I ended up building sort of my own little empire in Germany, uh, learned, learned the, the language on the border, right. uh, you know, cause I wanted to solve the, you know, I wanted to end the cold war. So I knew if I spoke German, I'd understand what they were saying. Right. <laughs> so I'm not kidding. I literally thought that like, if, if I, <laughs> if I can, <laughs> you know, you're 19 years old, right. You're on the border. You're like, I can do this, right. I can do so, this. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, I learned German quite quick and I realized in that moment that when they called me, they said, the mayor's here and no one speaks German. We heard you speak German. And I was a PFC. I was a, you know, an E3. Right. And so I went up and helped the mayor of the city. Uh, I think it was Frankfurt at the time, uh, translate for the commander. And that set sort of set the pace for my career. If you know right. what I mean. So I was the I was the cheese ball that always got chosen to be the colonel's driver, the sergeant major's driver, and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> and and then I did go back to the line unit. And I was on tanks, so nice. I was on tanks for a while. And then anyway, so I got out, and I stayed in Germany, where of course, as a tanker, there's not much applicable sort of knowledge that you can use on the civilian market, especially not in Germany, where they don't understand what it means to be a veteran. Well, and that and that that was one thing I wanted to ask you, which was. You got out and you stayed in Germany. So yeah, how many European guys? Out. Yeah, how many guys do that? How many people do that? I shouldn't just classify no, them as guys. It's, it's a handful. It's right. a handful. I mean, it's, well, it's almost all guys. I've I, I met one woman who did it, and that's because right. she literally married the guy who owned the restaurant five feet in front of the gate of the of the, of the post, literally, and like she like moved, she moved right over there. But uh, yeah, you know, a small handful in Berlin. I think there was. Maybe twenty of us in a, in a city of three point eight million. So, right, um, yeah, and actually twenty is not bad because if you think about Berlin Brigade, we only had you know one company of tanks and we had um, one infantry, one support, one artillery, or something like that, and that was it. So, it's actually quite a few. But Berlin was unique. Was what right. they used to say. A pretty crazy city. Yeah, like a, like in how so? Because I'm thinking about it in the context of you're you're a young guy, you're getting out of the military you know, to step out into the abyss, so to speak, and just lay or stay, not lay, but stay in Germany. That, that takes a lot of balls, man. I'm, I mean, really it takes a lot of balls. And well, it was self-preservation, I think, because really? if, if I look at where I came from and I came from a place that I didn't want to go back to at that moment. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, you know, typical American nightmare of childhood. I don't have to go into it, but you know, it's that typical thing. Five, right. you know, I don't know, four, four step fathers, blah, blah, blah. And, um, I said, man, if I, if I go back now after eight years or seven and a half years, it's like with my tail between my leg, man, I don't right. care what I have to do. I'm not going home. Got it. And the only thing I knew was Germany. So, cause right. I was stationed there my entire career. Right. So I was stationed in four different places and I ended up to saying, all right, I'm stay here. And I had friends there and I met all the people that I spoke German with all the time because like I said, I spoke German. Right. Uh, so I just didn't know what to do. Literally, you, you want to know the truth of what I did? <laughs> yeah. I've never told this story before. <laughs> Please. I've never told this story before. I'm sure the statutes, statutes of limitations are, are over. <laughs> I hope Anyways, so, yeah. <laughs> so I found out there's this like obscure law in Germany that says if you've been stationed in Germany or you've lived in Germany for six years without a break and you can prove it, that you're automatically entitled to a living permit and a working oh, wow. permit. Okay. And that's the hard part. That's the hard part because they weren't giving Americans anything back in those right. days. 
still aren't actually. Um, <clears throat> well, if you're from Syria, you get it, but not not if you're from America. Right. Um, but uh, just a little side joke there. Mm-hmm. Anyway, um, so I found a lieutenant um, supply guy to write a letter and sign it for. I wrote the letter. He signed it for me and said that I'd been there for six years, which I had, right. you know, on, without break. And he signed like supply or something. Then I took it to the, the American Library, had it translated into German by the official translator and stamped with this big rubber stamp. The Germans love stamps. And I uh, went to the permit op- place and they gave me a permit, working and living permit. Wow. But but I, before that, I couldn't I couldn't get a job. I couldn't apply. So I had to do something to get out right. of the military. So I got a job at the PX. Got it. In Ber- uh, so I had left Berlin a year earlier, went to Schweinfurt mm-hmm. and got out and came back to Berlin and started working in the PX, working at the jewelry counter. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously? Yeah. Holy shit. And there, yeah, you want to talk about holy shit? Yeah. The troops that I was leading, okay, I was I was only E5, but still right. I had, you know, I had some guys. They're like, hey, great career choice, Sergeant Coon. You know, right. they're at the PX. Yeah. So that was how I started out. And uh, <clears throat> I didn't have anything on the civilian market. So when I left that job to go to a security job, I didn't have enough money to do anything with my car. So I saw had a, I had a POV with American license plates on it. Right. I drove that thing for a year with those <laughs> license plates, and no insurance in Germany. I mean, <laughs> crazy. Yeah, yeah. Crazy, crazy. And so I had to pay to get that thing. Tra- you know, it, was, it was crazy, but yeah, that's how I started my life. And, and it was, it was, it was an experience. I didn't complain or say, this is hard. I'm like, this is like adventure. If I can figure this out, man, I can figure anything out. No, that's true. Cause you're in a foreign country you're trying to figure out how to make a living. And then yeah. also at the same time, like, what are you going to do with your life? Like, yeah. like, what the fuck am I going to do with my life? Because I'm sure even at the time you're like, this isn't the pinnacle of my professional career working at the jewelry counter at the PX, <laughs> right? Nope. Not unless I was going to make a heist or something, but that didn't come into my mind. Right. So what what was no. that? What was that? What was going on back then? Because you know a lot of guys transition, yeah. they, we go through the same kind of psychological things of this is freedom. Oh shit! I I don't I, I don't have my tribe anymore. Yep. Oh, well, now no. I've got to try to find a tribe. You no know. meaning, no purpose. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I got out, and and I, you know, I became a doorman and a security guard, and a, and a security agent at the airport. So I had three jobs. Wow. Uh, so it was literally from four in the morning until ten in the morning at the airport, twelve noon to seventeen hundred at the insurance guy, the security at the insurance company, and then from seven o'clock at night until two o'clock in the morning, a doorman at the Hard Rock Cafe. So that was three jobs. Right. And uh, the Hard Rock Cafe is where I met, where I realized what the deal is and how I can always have these short term goals that lead me somewhere else. So got it. I, re- I realized that when I, when people confront me at the door, right. Yeah. Or wherever I typically at the door, cause they have to go through me to get in. Right. That's my chance to, 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 to leave an impression. Mm-hmm. So what do you do? You elevate them. You make them feel good. You make you compliment them. You, you give them advice, you give them right. help, you walk them to the table, that kind of just, just, you really give it all. And I mean, that paid off quick. That's how I got my first bodyguard job um, with, uh, I think it was Ian Gillian from Deep Purple. It wasn't much. It was just for, you know, like right. an hour. But yeah, yeah. I was there. And that just sort of spread around. And the next thing you know, I'm, I'm bodyguarding Mick Jagger, you know, things wow. like that. But I always realized that it's always a stepping stone to get where I need to go. I wasn't sure where I was going. Right. But I was wise enough to say, actually, if I do some cool stuff and I love it and it takes me to the next level, why wouldn't I love that? So let's go. Let's just do it. Right. And next thing you know, I'm opening up the old, you know, World War II officers club into a club, calling it from the Air Force because I was also in Berlin. Right. Uh, I was it was just doing some crazy stuff, and I opened up three cocktail bars and a nightclub, and I got involved in the night life in Berlin and sort of got in some trouble, and uh, yeah, ended up you know a little bit behind bars, not a long time, just you know, right enough enough to get me in court, <laughs> and uh, yeah, you know, and just just crazy stuff, and I just kept I never thought oh god this is it or what's my life about I never thought right. that. Until, uh, like, uh, I guess it was 2003 when I was at the pinnacle of my life. I was the director of European dro- operations for a big corporation from the UK. It was listed. And they had me heading up a joint venture of, out of an American a NASDAQ listed company. I had no degree, no experience. I was just like, it was all just, I can do this. Right. right? And they, they believed me. And I did do it. I was quite successful. And I was making a lot of money. I was overweight. had a big car. I was married. uh, uh and it all came crashing down, man. So my wife cheated on me, and she left me. I lost my job and all my money within a week. 
Whoa. So you yeah. went from the high of highs to the low of lows within a very short amount of time. What yep. year was that? 2003, is that what you said? December 2002. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So 2000. And that's when I decided, um, okay, man, uh, I, I wasn't completely broken down, but I said, man, this sucks. And of course, I sort of felt like, okay, if she cheated on me, then I don't need her anyway. Right. I hurt, it, it hurt, but it was, it was clear to me that it was better. Yeah. Uh, and the money thing, I always, I, I'm, I'm the kind of guy I can always create money somehow, right. I don't know how, but it just, just created in, 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 into reality. But there was that mission thing again, right? There I was, I had the job, I had it all, I had the dream, what right. they say, right? And, and I lost it all. So I ended up just saying, fuck it, I'm going to write a book. <laughs> and there it is. I wrote a book. It was a, it's a German bestseller. Okay, you're called, gonna have to translate that for me. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. it says it says it literally it says um, soldier in the Gulf War mm-hmm. from uh, from fighter to uh, cynic. Oh wow! So from, okay, yeah. So it's basically why I went how I went to war and the things I've I realized and then how I came back. I was a bit cynical about it all, if you will. Right. And that came out in March or was it February of 2003? The day, right? The war started in Iraq. Yeah, interesting. So the day the new. Yeah, so I went on TV, and I went on a year TV tour, book tour, reading tour. Uh, I was on TV three times a day in Germany, Austria, and Switzerland. Wow. And it just shot me to the moon. But I had no time to develop anything with that. So I was like, you know, I was broke and homeless, basically. And then next thing you know, on TV, living out of my car, (laughs) you know, showing up to the TV station, had nowhere to go after that. I was getting paid $500 here, $1,000 there. It wasn't much, euros, you know. Yeah, so that that was my 2003 and then I sort of waffled around for a while and went back to the corporation. They, they brought me back at a different level. I uh, hated it, but I did it and kept looking for new things. And then I met some royals and uh, on a boat. And he was sitting there by himself and she was sitting over there. And I said, you guys want a beer or something? You want to join us? And we ended up founding the Civil Coalition of Germany, which is a non-party political organization. And I helped sort of organize it stru- structural-wise. And this right. is where the army training came in, right? I'm like – yeah. One, two, three, one, two, three, you know, grid, grid wise, just did the whole army thing. Right. And we killed it. We killed it. And it came, it's now the largest, still alive. It's still going. That was 13 years ago, 14 years ago. Um, it's, it's the largest, um, non-party political organization in Germany. So what are the values of that? So what's the mission statement and values of, of, of the organization? Completely grassroots, Uh completely grassroots, completely for the people, by the people. Uh, and we, we put out polls. These are the five issues we can talk mm-hmm. about and we can go push towards, you know, uh, politicians or whatever, which ones do you want? And whatever they vote on, we go. And we have, at the time we had, you know, not many, but I was, I was going out collecting money cause we were, we're an NGO or right. a nonprofit. Right. And one of the guys, and this is where I got the idea for email marketing. He said, look, I don't need money. I said, what do you got? And he goes, emails. I'm like, how many? He goes, 5 million. I was like, give them here. Right. And that's how so we got the first idea. I'm like, holy shit, this is powerful. So we made a video presenting who we were. And what we did to make sure we don't get decimated is we had a person from every walk of life. So we had ex ex journalists, ex editors, students, foreigners, me, uh, white, black, brown, yellow, purple, everything. And we did a right. video talking about it. And we, we sent it to those five million emails and made one point one million. Nice. Right? And donations. And that's what started us on our way. And now that turned into a party and that's now the third largest party in Germany and the most powerful upcoming party. The party was formed about six years ago. We took it over four years ago with the civil coalition, just sort of like <laughs> took it over and put our leader in, in parliament in the EU, worked with her there. And now she's in the parliament in the, in the Bundestag and the German Bundestag and as a party head. Wow. Yeah. And the issues are, um, it's conservative. It's basically a Trump without the jokes. If you Got know it. what I mean? Yeah. So, <laughs> Germans don't laugh. So, right. you know, uh, <laughs> so yeah, it's basically, it's very conservative. It's, it's for sovereignty, national sovereignty. Um, the European union is fine just as long as they don't make the decisions for the, you know, for the government. Right. Stuff like that. Very powerful. Very, very strong. So are they considered in Germany because, uh, and I, you'll have to explain this to me in the landscape of German politics, because it, it appears to me they have more than two parties. Whereas in the yes. United States we have, a two-party system, essentially. I mean, for it, it could only be defined as that, actually, just based right. on the previous couple hundred years. So yep. there, how many parties do you have in Germany? Well, real parties, there's, yeah. there's five right now, five real parties. Right. And then there's like three or four fringe parties, like mm-hmm. the Pirates. You know, and then they have the Blue, what are they called? The Blue, I don't know. It's, so the Blue something, they're like senior citizens. It's all kinds of different parties. Got it. And uh, 
ours is called the AFD, the alternative for Germany, not the alternatives, right. <laughs> but just just an alternative for Germany. Got so you it. have the Christian Democrats, you got the social, de- you get the social Democrats, you got the the Christian Union, and it has nothing to do with Christianity anymore. It did, right? Um, but we're very we're very Christian based. We're not like Bible thumpers, I guess you could call it, but very Christian based, Christian values, family values, atomic family. Well, that's that's the child, you know, taking care of your children, family. That's what we're really oriented on, Got which it. makes us the enemy of the state at the, in Germany at the moment. So yeah, it's pretty tough. Yeah, which which is leads me into my next question, which is what are the big issues in Germany right now? Because you obviously you've got the hot button issues that are always they're they're political cannon fodder here in the United States, and you can right. you know you have border security obviously right now with wall. You've yep. always got the abortion issues, right? Then you've got on top of abortion, you have gun rights. So you've got gun rights, abortion. You've got border security. Those are all the the three I would say. Well, the three top that I can name off the top of my head. What are you guys dealing with over there? Immigration is number one still. Okay, you know, after, got it. After Merkel, after Merkel let in, um, um, well, give me a, let me give you a statistics. So yeah. the Berlin Wall was up for forty years, right? right? And everybody who tried to cross it, a lot of people, they got shot and killed. You mm-hmm. heard about that, right? Correct. Well, in the last four years, immigrants have killed more. Germans than the 40 years they got killed on the wall. I'll just give you an idea of the crime level that happened and is happening in Germany. In a city in Berlin, there's 3.5 million Germans uh, in or residents in Berlin, and there's 80,000 refugees in Berlin. What? Yes, 80,000 refugees in Berlin. There's oh, there's over 2.5 million refugees that went into Germany within a year and a half. That's... And what they did is they, they they put them in places like little villages. Right. So there's a village of 2,000 people. Like I live in here in Hungary. I'm in yeah. Hungary. I'm outside of the city, and uh, they put in a village of 2,000, you know, families. They put in a thousand male refugees, and that city is completely destroyed now in Germany. They all moved away. The houses are worth nothing. They lost their money. It's horrible. Um, and it's I, I I was working in Germany at the time when it started, and I came home to Budapest and I went to the train station, and that's when the Hungarians said, "Wait a second, Germany." In the Dublin Accords, forced us to sign the declaration that no um, a refugee is allowed into your country unless they registered in the first European country they touched, which would be Greece. Right. But Greece is like, go, 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 go. Yeah. Get out. And then, yeah, get out. And so they went to Austria. They went to Germany. And when they came to Hungary, Hungarians said, hell no, you're not coming through our country. We'll, we'll just breaking the law. And then the Germans said, let them through. And the prime minister here said, I'm not letting them through. So we build a fence. Of course, he was called a Nazi overnight. Now, now he has two fences, <laughs> right. um, and uh, he's you know the country loves him for that. Matter of fact, most of Europe, uh, the politics anyway, hate him. The politicians hate him, but he's a he's a he's a strong figure here and there. And so, I went back to Germany, and when I went back between here and there, they had already had refugees come into this little village, this beautiful little like picturesque village in the mountains of Germany. And all of a sudden, you have like at nighttime, at nine o'clock, when everybody else is sleeping because it's a little village. Like 150, 200 refugees in bathrooms with beers or whatever they're drinking, sitting on the sidewalk in the middle of the street. And I was like, "What the, you know?" And the cops are scared, and the Germans are scared, and no one's doing anything. It got to the point where I was working there during the week at night. I would just go to the store and just hang out and protect the, the girls, you know, behind the counter. Because these guys would come in and start harassing them, and no one would do anything about it. It was crazy because Germans are passive. You got to realize right. if you if a German raises his hand, he's a Nazi. Got it. And that's the worst. It's it's actually illegal to do the Nazi salute in Germany. It's right. it's illegal to say Hitler like so. You don't. They're very like oh, call the police and police are like excuse me and they punch the police in the face and walk away. It's crazy. So firsthand yeah. experience with uh, yep. uh, open border, essentially yes. immigration policy, and what it does to communities. I, I I think that's pretty. For me, that's a very logical step. Which is, if we put a thousand refugees into a city of 2000 people. So essentially one, you're increasing the size by 30% of the, by 30% of the population instantly. And now 30% of your population is from the outside of that, that community. You're changing the dynamic of the community overnight. Yep. That just and seems very harmful. Like did they not well, think through this? Or did oh, there's they? an agenda. There's no, they did, of course. That's exactly what they thought through. Right. So um, there's an agenda, you know, and uh, uh, it's you know I don't want to get into it because you know conspiracy theories and all that kind of stuff. But it, in in basics, it's they want to take away the sovereignty of Europe. It's like it's called it's called 
um, e- economic terrorism, basically, is what they're doing. So they send a bunch of people up here, and the, well, this is what happened. So when this trail started of all these caravans coming, suddenly coming from right. Syria and Africa, yeah. when they landed, when they, it was just suddenly, it just started. Well, I have friends in different places, as you do, and um, they they were all told, and it was, you know, in foreign countries, you have, you know, people who work at the State Department that ensure that they watch immigration and yeah. see that they were all told to stand down. Hmm. Interesting. All the European nations said, stand down. So they stood right. down and suddenly, whoo, so I go to the train station, like I said, right? And I see all these freaking refugees and they're chanting and saying, Allah Akbar, fuck you. And it'll, it's on video. You can look on YouTube. Go Allah Akbar, fuck you and Budapest. You'll see it. Right. And um, uh, I, I, I'm like, I, I need to find me a Syrian. Right? right. Interview. So I have my, my iPhone and I'm looking around asking, and there's, you know, <laughs> I'm Kurdish, I'm Afghani, I'm, you know, Persian. I'm, right. you know, everything but Syrian. Like literally thousands of people. And I found one guy, right? Beard. Right. And he had like um, he had like these two young boys with him. I'm like, are you Syrian? He goes, yes, I am. Perfect English. And he studied he studied um, medicine somewhere in the states or in Canada or something. And I said, what are you doing here? Why are you here? Like, you don't need to come. He goes, well, honestly, I went to the. They were giving everybody three thousand euros to leave. So you go to the bank, pick up three thousand euros, and off you go. I was like, will you say that on film? He's like, hell no. <laughs> That's <laughs> no crazy. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, come on. He goes, yeah. Why do you think these people are here? And the way I know it's true, because my father-in-law, this is probably getting in trouble with someone hears this, but my father-in-law is a taxi driver. Right. Right. And it was illegal to put to take them in taxis because they were illegal, you know, but of course, taxi drivers in a third world country, I don't want to say Hungary's third world, but it's close. Right. Um, they were, they didn't, had no concept of the money. So they pulled out this big wad of money and they said, how much? And they said, uh, 200 euros for, uh, you know, which would cost them usually two euros. They just, right. They're like, okay, just they didn't know, and no concept of money. They all had stacks of money, so it must have been true. So there's something behind it we don't know about that no one's talking about. And now they just signed the the um, the river the the UN uh, refugee um, um, agreement now in um, Casablanca or was it no Marrakesh, right? Okay. In December, and for the UN, and it's basically saying that you every refugee is now an immigrant, like automatically, so you can't wow. turn them away anymore. Yeah, they're gonna kill wow. Europe. And, yeah, and they forced Hungary. They said, you cannot turn them away. So he said, okay. So he moved the fence from the border 200 meters in. <laughs> he calls it the transit zone so they can come to Hungary, but they have to stay in the transit zone <laughs> on the other side of the fence. <laughs> Seriously? <laughs> yeah, I'm dead serious, man. <laughs> Holy shit. <laughs> He's squared away, man. He's squared away, you know, when it comes to that. Some people hate him. Some people love him. But you can't please everyone. All I know is that I love living here. Right. My kids... You know, people are polite. They they don't fight. They don't argue with each other. They don't look at each other mean. And they don't. It's just. It's a very very great place for my kids to grow up. They speak three languages. They're only three and four, almost four and five. Uh, it's 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 amazing to be here. Amazing to be here. In Hungary, Germany. In no Hungary. More. That's, why left, right. that's why I left Germany. Right. Also because when I was in the party, working with the party pretty heavily, um, and the organization to discredit us because I'm American, they always said, "Oh, he's CIA." Oh, right. gotcha. Yeah. So it was like, oh, here we go again. So I had to go out of the public eye for like six months and sort of disappear. And I come back and, you know, so now I'm just out of the public eye and I just do everything per this video or right. secure communication, that kind of stuff. But well, it's, it's pretty bad. They bombed her car. They firebombed her car. They attacked her on vacation in a foreign country. Um, yeah, it's no joke. Man. The, 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 the left, the Antifa left is the same in Germany. Same is thing. it really? So it, that's where it's, it's the same party. Well, it's the same organization, yeah. Is Antifa. it really? Yeah, so, it's where they were born. <laughs> well, that that's interesting to me because you know there's there's speculation and and conspiracy theory ultimately and and where it's being supported, where's the funding coming from? Uh, you know, we we've all kind of heard the Soros, yeah. uh, the the it's being funded by Soros. Well, well he's Hungarian, right? right? Yeah, and there's billboards here that says Soros is promoting, you know, the whole thing. I mean, it's literally on a freaking billboard all over the city. Seriously, <laughs> during the elections, yeah, it was crazy. I took pictures of it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they don't they don't mince words here. This is like I said, this is still East Block, right? Yeah, so it's I don't know who's financing it. I just know that there's a lot of money out there, and it's endless, endless. Yeah. That's and if you look, if you want to know a tip, look behind who actually is behind George Soros, and it's not him; it's somebody else. It's a much younger guy who's much richer. Really? Yep. Are, are, and where are they from? Do you know? 
Oh, he's from New York. That guy. Okay. I'm talking about. Gotcha. Yeah, you can look. You you'll find it. It's easy right. to find. I don't want to say his name though, but right. you'll find it real easy. And and you know, there's just like Mercer, you know, financed Robert Mercer financed uh, the Trump thing, and his you know, blah, his daughter Rebecca right. ran the transition team, and right. gotcha. that kind of stuff. I mean, look, I, I even got suggested for the transition team. Believe it or not, me. Like I'm like I'm a buck sergeant. What the hell do I got? You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, I mean Steve Bannon was here in Hungary visiting because he's now Steve Bannon is actually working for the Prime Minister of Hungary now as his consultant. Interesting. Yeah, and his his Steve Bannon's nephew Sean, right, um, uh, was here in Hungary and we were mailing back and forth about having coffee. <laughs> okay, you know, like it's, it cracks me up because I just do what I do because because of, of the belief you know systems that I have and, and the yeah. principles that I have. Like I believe in truth. I believe in the, the the you know the people's rights, and it's weird how that's so powerful when you literally do it without personal gain, without looking to try to personal gain, because then it right. just flies. It's pretty pretty crazy. Well, I, and besides that, you've got um, you know so transitioning more from the political aspects of things to the business side of things. You know what are what are you doing right now in the in the business and veteran entrepreneurs uh, entrepreneur space? <clears throat> because I think. You know, most of our listeners are going to be tuned in for that, even though this right. is really interesting and you and I could probably dive down some <laughs> rabbit holes. Uh, what, what are you doing over there? Well, I started back in October 2017 with uh, with my first online gig mm-hmm. that, that was a live. You know, so I figured I'd do a live on Facebook. Right. And I found, you know, I found some veteran groups. and I joined them and just started giving free advice because where I come from is a 20 year career of consulting. So I, like I said, I consulted, you know, NASDAQ, Fortune 500, those kind of companies. And I was a turnaround guy. So I would always go in, fix and go, fix and go, fix and go. Right. What's up, gents? And uh, so I would fix this company, fix that company, fix this company, fix that company. And um, I just started doing this online and saying, doing it for free, basically. Mm -hmm. Saying, hey, I'm going to, this is a problem if you have it, this is how you fix it. This problem is how you fix it. And that turned into a big business for me, actually, actually a very, very big business. And I now what I do now is I help companies grow and I bring them to people who either invest in them, market them, find them, whatever. And, you know, just as an example, in the last what month and a month and 18 days, I've gotten equity in 11 companies helping them turn around, grow or whatever, plus plus, you know, upfront fees and things like that, including a really exciting stuff with like the Austrian army. And I mean, just really, really cool stuff. And that's only because of the people that I've helped all these years. See, I have a, I have a real clear, clear principles called HIT, honesty, integrity, transparency. And you invest in relational capital, which means I invest in everyone around me before I even think about taking anything. Right. So I give, 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 constantly give, been given for years. And now they just come like, Steve, what do you need? What do you need? What do you need? Like, can you introduce me to them? Can you introduce me to them? Can you do? And they do. And, um, yeah, it's just, it's pretty, it's flying right now. But I've helped 200 solopreneurs, veterans, uh, uh since 17, as of since the, uh, since December of 2017 until today, over 200 solopreneurs, um, uh, veteran owned businesses, b- b- business entrepreneurs. And I do that at a super cut rate or if they can't afford it, sometimes free, you know, depending on what, what the outcome can be. Yeah. And I think it's important here for us to identify, like we don't have some type of business relationship. Like you, we're not, you know, no. I, I'm not being paid to promote it or anything. It's just Steve and I've no. been talking about talking for uh, well, well over a year now. <laughs> it's an interesting guy. He's got a ton of stuff going on as far as, you know, value add, so just want to clarify that we're, we're not getting yeah. a marketing, a marketing no, percentage no. or anything. So maybe after the show. Well, <laughs> and, and we're, we're definitely in line on that, which is, you know, we started yeah. this show ultimately just to provide value to veteran entrepreneurs, guys that are transitioning to tell the story right. of guys that have done the same thing, which is they've transitioned out of the military and then they've moved on to successful careers or not successful too, right? It's, it's right, yeah, how do you continue to transition and transition it in a way that uh, you feel proud of what you've done and then what the next chapter of your life is going to be. So it's, it's purely value add. We, we actually don't run advertising here at, from the, yeah, from the podcast yeah. whatsoever, because that's, that's what part of the value add Too you and I talked about it too, where it's like, we, we get a ton of questions from guys and I thought, you know, there's no better way to reach a wide audience and then answer a wide variety of questions than a podcast and just make it free. Super right. easy. Download it, listen exactly. to it. If it's value, it's value. If it's not, it's not. But exactly. And, and there's, there's, there's ways to do that too, without mm-hmm. waiting. You can actually go out and be proactive like you are. Like, like I, I mean, you go to the events too. Mm-hmm. And what, what I see is one of the more I speak openly publicly, the more uh, I can affect directly 
Right. So when you see someone and sometimes it's like, Hey, I could just question for you. And I, I literally like find 200 grand in 15 minutes at a company. Like mm -hmm. you, it's there, it's right there. Just use it and do this and that. Or someone will ask me something, you know, at one of the events and it'll take three minutes for me to change their entire business. And that's not because I'm a wonder boy. It's just because I've literally worked and turned around like hundreds of businesses or locations or, you know, whatever. So it's for me, it's a true pleasure to be able to affect someone's life that much just in a few minutes. And if I can do that, I'd be foolish not to help. You know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Where, um, where, where can people find what you're doing online? Right. Right. Well, I have I have three different things. One is the last goal setting course you'll ever need, mm -hmm. um, and and the other one is my immediate impact revenue program, which is a online uh, monthly you know subscription where you join a Facebook group with myself and a bunch of other um, entrepreneurs. On Tuesdays we have high performance um, uh, learning with. Lane Ballone, who's a Special Forces veteran, teaches that Special Forces mindset. Uh, Wednesdays, you have a hot seat with me where I turn, you know, I find one solution for your business to turn it around. Thursdays, we have professional day. And that's anybody who has, has a professional, um, um, who has a profession and has tangible results and long years of experience, like the Dollar Beard Club owner. Yeah, who, yeah. We have him on. He teaches subscription sales or they mm -hmm. teach webs, you know, whatever, whatever we teach. And then Fridays is business and body mindset with a famous uh, trainer from the UK. And you get all that for hundred forty nine dollars a month and then you can find all that information on my website which is steven with a v dash k u h n dot com well this is awesome man and honestly you know because i've listened to the podcast not because you know i've been on it but i think what yeah. you're doing is value add and i think the, the more tools we have as a veteran community and the more people we have access to for information um the better we're going to be so for uh for me and the launch code listeners i know that you'd be value add. And the other thing is, you. is you've also got a ton of stuff on YouTube that's, that's free. So you've got information yeah. that you can log in, you can yeah. check out, you can do your research, you know, you know, something that, that you do is not for everybody, but it's definitely for some people. And, yeah. uh, you know, when you need to take a step above, I think some of these other YouTube tutorials, because there's a ton of them out there. Yep. You and I both know it. It's every fucking guy that's ever started a business. And then it's like, yep. and what typically what I find is <clears throat> guys that are giving out business advice, um, I would say probably 50% of the time it's because they weren't very good at business to begin with. And so they started trying to hand out, hand out advice, uh, which is a, especially if you know people in the industry and yeah. you're like, well, I know that guy, he was, he's yeah. basically his board yeah. voted him out of the seat and then he yep. made a transition. Yep. <laughs> exactly. Like, exactly. Yeah. And unfortunately, unfortunately that's the case. And this is the deal is when you're working on a budget that those are the guys you grab, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You, know, you hear them. They're like, they're like, Hey, if you, for three ninety nine, you can have me for a month. I'm like, right. dude, you know what I mean? Like, and they're like, Oh wow, that's great. You know, what I always say is just Google them. Mm -hmm. And if they don't have at least a page or two, then forget right. it. You know, it's like, yeah. And if a page or two is like criminal, then definitely forget it. <laughs> yeah, you got to do your due diligence. On yeah, things. definitely. And, I mean, Google at least. I suggest anyone who who, who goes like likes my page, right. Stephen Cohen official, because that I do lives every night. It's always business, business wow. oriented, oriented, mindset oriented. It's always every single night about uh, thirteen, fourteen hundred East Coast. Mm -hmm. Sorry, every day, nighttime every day. here. <laughs> nighttime there. Yeah, and exactly. I've done it where, you know, looking at different coaches and I was, um, I brought in a coach last year. So I brought in an executive coach from, um, another company, uh, out of, uh, Portland, Oregon, actually. And they were, they're fantastic. You know, they, they plugged in, they provided a lot of advice. And a lot of this was articulating what you already feel, which is, I have a gut feeling, but I don't yeah. know how to articulate it. And then put it into a working document and then a process flow. So yeah. it's like, gosh, I got this gut feeling that my supply chain's a little bit fucked up, yeah. but I don't know how to fix it. So, oh, well, let's just pull this out. Let's pull this gut feeling yeah. out. Let's articulate yeah. it. And then let's go to work trying to solve it. Or say, you've got to do some work here to figure out even if it is messed up. Maybe it isn't. Yeah. Maybe it's just a feeling. And maybe it's just... I don't like the color of the tape next to my rollers within my packing organization or something like that. It could be just something as simple as that. Yeah. It's funny you, you say that because typically someone brings me in because they need money. Uh -huh. so revenue is not working or whatever. But that's rarely the problem. Right. You know, it's typically something like that. And I, I work purely with intuition or what right. you call gut feeling. Um, I, I personally work only with – like I'll literally – 
drive down the street because my my wife's like, where are you going? I don't know. You know, I'm just driving because my intuition told me to go. That's literally how hardcore I am with my, my wow. intuition. And it serves me amazingly in business. When I start feeling myself think, I stop. And I go back to, okay, what, what was I feeling? Stop thinking. Because that – I use the thinking to, to um, process and structure, mm-hmm. right? But I use my intuition to, uh, to recognize. And I, I basically what you just do, talked about, that's exactly what I do with businesses. It, it, <clears throat> we bring in guys every now and again. Actually, uh, Garrett is here. He's behind me. Bring guys in every now and again to uh, to just look at what we do, and they can sit down with the C levels that we have here at Black Rifle Coffee. Right. They can ask them questions, and oftentimes that's a learning experience for both of us because they're asking questions about process where you're like, ah, I actually haven't thought about why we do that. To be honest yeah. with you, that's a good yeah. point. Exactly. One of the things that we're working on right now, uh, tw- uh, Tom Davin and I are working on. Is our business make our uh, business decision making process here? Mm. So it's a what we're calling it in the military. It's a military decision making process or MDMP. We're we're calling it the business business decision making process, and but we're just doing that for the company. So it's something right. that we've we've realized that all these initiatives that you have to launch into your key initiatives that flow into your goals that flow into your mission statement, you've got to have an architecture behind that. Yeah. Or it'll just, it becomes quicksand. You know, like, yeah. we got 30 initiatives. We got people <clears throat> from across the divisions are working on these things. Not a clear articulation. So, you know, I'm a firm believer that you have to find information. And not all information is created equal. It, because everybody digests things differently so you know my my favorite teacher in in the you know the the 22 years that i went to or whatever the however many years that i went to school um wouldn't be yours necessarily right so people convey different types of information and oftentimes i gotta hear things because i'm dumb i gotta hear things three different ways three different times and it's like oh fuck okay i got it now right I can but you want out. to. You you want to hear it three different ways because mm-hmm. it's, it's it's three different perspectives. I, I call it PPS, people, procedures, and structures. That's right. that's the that's the thing that I always went in place when I show up. Literally, when I show up into, into a company, a, a, a you know physical company, mm-hmm. the first thing I do is switch everybody around. Right. So if, if I'm literally in power, because when when I when I turn companies around, I took it over as a CEO or the managing director or the general general manager, whatever. I'll go in and say, okay. If the leaders were sitting there and the employees were sitting there, now we're changing rooms, right? Right. And then we paint the walls and we did, we make everything new again and sort of like fix it all up. And then everyone was open because they're like, okay, what the hell's going on? But if I try to change somebody in their environment where they have habits formed already, it's super difficult. Right. So I just break all their habits, break what they're used to, break what they're staring at, switch up the people, and the next thing you know, they're they're really open. And then you can pour into working on that culture because the culture is what really forms a company. Right. The, the the PPS is the tree, right? The trunk right. of the tree and the branches and the leaves. The leaves are everything else: the process, of people, and the culture. Mm-hmm. Well, and we call That's it great. over here, which is a Tom Davin thing, not an Evan Hafer thing, which is people, process, and technology. So okay. it's nice. people, process, yeah. and technology because we're very heavily reliant upon technology. Um, yep. But very similar is, is, is we yeah. start to look at organizational systems and then breaking paradigms because evolution is something that you have to constantly do within a company. Yep. You really do. It's it's evolve or, evolve or die. especially or die. In, and, and that evolution typically comes from people coming in from the outside. So you right. got to do constantly asking for, for assistant and coaches and consultants and advisors and co- you know, just constantly, constantly. It's even for me as a, as just a single guy, I always, I have, I have what, three mentors. They're actually getting up there with all over 80 now. Um, and but they're, they're the ones that work on the sort of the mindset and the belief and, and sort of the big picture. And then I have consultants and coaches that work with me as well to keep me up up to date and abreast and where my weaknesses are when I'm reflecting about things like that so I could actually focus. And that's why I'm so effective. Like I literally go in, I'm like, done. It's the quicker I can do it, the better. Right. Well, that's exactly what I found too, is I brought in a coach and it, it elevated my level and I firmly believe in coaching. I firmly believe right. in mentorship. You can't evolve in any, nope. in any endeavor. When I, when I say that, you know, Olympians have thousands of hours of coaching that are poured into them from the time that they're children to the point of which yeah. they're on the podium, regardless of when they're le- when they're when they're meddling. And the same thing in in any of these endeavors, whether it's shooting or any athletic performance, coaching is just acceptable. They're just like it's yeah. standard. It's acceptable, right? Yeah. 
It's a must. It would be foolish if you didn't. It would be foolish. Right? And it, not only that, people would say, what the fuck are you doing? You're trying to teach yourself how to do a, this, you know, a complex Olympic lift or box. And you think that you're going to box or do jujitsu or any of these any of these skill sets and you don't have a coach are you fucking stupid and yeah, quite literally exactly. you would be you would be and business is so no different it's, exactly. it's no so different, why, would be different? Yeah, yeah. It's, why do you think that is why do you think it is you think it's because people think it makes them look weak it makes them yeah. look weak right like oh you need help i thought you were the big man or whatever yeah, yeah be, because it's i think people often think that leaders are just they're self-built and they don't need help for whatever reason, I don't know where this this image comes from, um, because we all know there's the outward facing. You know, so it, you can look at any business, you can look at any successful politician or any successful athlete. There, there is there are there's an army of people behind them that typically help them on a regular basis, if not a wide variety of perspectives, people, process, technology throughout the day. You just see it, and you're like, well, I only see that one person. You know, he's doing it all. It's like, 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 like uh, Steve Jobs, like uh, what's that comedian that talks about Steve Jobs? You know, he'd go in, on his nerd stage and be like, yeah, thank you. You know, but he went backstage and says, I want all my music on this little device right now. And he tells right. like 300 scientists to do it for him. You know? <laughs> yeah, he couldn't do it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> he couldn't do it. And, no, exactly. Yeah. And if you're really trying to get to the next level, I, I, I highly encourage guys. And this is leads into my next question, which is you've had to have had some books in your life. You've had to had some, you know, perspective as far as, uh, guys that you watch and admire who, who are the guys that you've read and watched that, that really have changed your life. Man, there's so many, it's, it's it goes through phases. First yeah. of all, I rarely read whole books. Like mm -hmm. I rarely read the whole book. I usually look for something in a book and mm -hmm. I find it and that's good enough for me. Right. And then I, then I'll go back years later. And, oh, grab it. So first, you know, I first started out when I started, got out of the military, I wanted basics. So I had the one minute manager, right? right? The one minute manager moved, who moved my cheese, the one minute manager in sales, the one minute sales minute, all this kind of stuff. So it was real simple stuff, stories. It was easy to read. Right. And that, that, that taught me the basics. I literally ran my first companies like that and I freaking killed it. That's what got me to the point of being a corporate manager with no experience. Cause they said, where'd you learn this stuff? And I'm thinking like, holy shit, these little one minute books it can't be that easy. Right. <laughs> so yeah, seriously. And, uh, and so I killed it. And, um, and then I moved on to the real, you know, the real uh, complicated things like power play and I forget what they're called. Uh, this one here, power. Uh, this is oh, a yeah. German, Robert Green. Robert mm -hmm. Green. Yeah. This is a German one. So, yeah. but the forty-eight, the forty-eight laws of power. Uh, then, then I, then that was like over the top. When I had my crash after that, I sort of went spiritual. Got it. And I started reading uh, Paolo Coelho and you know the, the the Jacob's Way, the Jacob's Trail, that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And now I, I'm, I'm into right now I'm into quantum physics. So my absolute favorite book that I keep as a Bible is um, the Happy Pocket Full of Money. Hmm. And it's all about how to you know live your life in total abundance and not worry about money because it's always going to be there. Right. right, that kind of thing. And that's sort of what I've I've embedded into my coaching. And it's it, people's lives are exploding. It's crazy how you know you talk to somebody and just tell them to let go, stop cramping and grabbing at it you know just right. let it go let it grow right next you know two months later like triple revenue <laughs> amazing stuff but as far as people go you know i met kofi on on one time and for on tv you wouldn't think he's a very you know impressive guy but he's very impressive right rest in peace, rest in peace. um i had the opportunity to work with the grand duke of oldenburg who no one knows who he is but he's quite the player over here um and these people took me under their wing and just told me more importantly than business they taught me contenance also they caught they taught me how to act yeah they taught me how to talk how to stand how to look how to walk how to how to enter a room how to own that room um uh, you know how to use your energy to sort of take over uh be noticed not take over but be noticed and that more than anything i think uh, uh plays a huge role in me being able to, to land these huge deals and work with with people and sell 50, you know, 50 million dollars worth of product in a year to walmart and tesco and or call what at costco and target and all those places right. um you know just out of the blue and things like that it's all has to do with i, don't, I hate the word networking mm -hmm. uh but it's i call it relational capital yeah so and, and literally i i when i see someone that i can help look i this is my this is my my whole vision is this oh we're CEOs of our own life enterprise. Most CEOs of their own life enterprise should be fired. Uh, you know, yeah. who, 
who who are CEOs responsible to? The stakeholders, right? right? So if you look at your life as a, as an enterprise, everything in it, the stakeholders are everything from your family to friends, everybody who you, yeah. you touch, and your job is to make their life better because you're the CEO running your company, right? right? So you elevate them, you make them feel great, you invest in them, you let them, you let them in a better place, you leave them in a better places when you approach them. That's mm-hmm. my that's my whole symphony of life, and it served me so well. I mean, it's incredible the people that reach out to me. Incredible. I mean. Incredible. I just can't even tell you the people that reach out to me for assistance. And now I get, you know, WhatsApp is like my best friend with all the German politicians and some some Europeans and European uh, parliament members. It's crazy, you know, so. I couldn't agree more. I, I think I look at things the same way, which is you have to, you, well, one, I'm a big visualization exercise guy. I try to visualize exactly where you are with your family, with your business, and being able to put yourself in it, and for for a lack of a better term, it's it 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 is a form of meditation. If you're putting yourself in these areas, you're visualizing what's happening and the steps that you need to take in order to create the outcome that you're trying to achieve. Yeah. And Man, you're talking my language. If you don't do that, then you're yeah. never visualizing and putting yourself into that circumstance. You never know what it feels like. Then you're so reactionary at life then you're, you live a very, ultimately not you, but you're living such a reactionary life that you can't visualize yourself in that, that perspective. You can't visualize and look at yourself and say, what is my, what is the, the, the greatest thing that I can achieve that I want in my life? Put yourself there and be right. realistic, right? Because it's, you know, you can't say, I want to have fucking x-ray vision or something. Cause that's just, that's, that's, that's just fiction. There's a difference between, right fiction reality visualization and then yeah, a positive yeah. mental exercise right exactly well it's funny you say that because we, we teach that in the in the um, goal setting course and mm-hmm. what I, I see a lot of people so the goal setting course is different because we teach how to set goals how to vision how what kind of identity you are who you are what you're all about that dictates your goals right that dictates mm-hmm. where you're headed and then you have uh what you want to reach <laughs> come on kids kids my kids are here so uh. That's fine. Oh, My, mine are That's around okay. all the time in content. Yeah, too, I know. So I just, they're just a little bit loud here. So, <laughs> but what people forget about um, goals is that you need to create a lifestyle that surrounds those goals. So if you if you want to buy a Bentley, and your goal is to buy a Bentley, you might get that Bentley, but then you don't have the money to put the gas in there, pay the insurance. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? So your goal should be the lifestyle of a person who owns a Bentley. Right. right? That should be the goal. So if you want to run a big business. What kind of a person runs a big business, right? right? What kind of a person, what kind of life do they live? Mm-hmm. And that's what we call the 30-year goal. So we actually go for the 30-year goal um, when we go into our courses. So the courses that we do is a 30-year goal. So you have you have a minimum of 100 goals you have to set up, you know? Uh, a thir- 30 year goals you have to set up 100 over 30 years. And that's very challenging. But when you do that, it opens up your horizons. Right. And then like you said, you're setting yourself up for seeing where you're already going to be, mm-hmm. and you're, you start living the life before it even st- before you actually are living it, and then you it sort of makes it come true almost. It's crazy, but it works. <laughs> Man, I, fu- I love this. We're gonna have to have you back on. We're like 15 minutes over time on our on our uh, on our typical launch code, but uh, I, I I've loved the conversation. I've, I'll have you back on for sure because it's a fucking cool conversation. I can have it all day long. Uh, where can people find you one more time? Stephen dash poon.com. It's a Stephen with a V and then a dash K U H N.com. Everything you you need is on there. Cool. Hey dude, thanks a lot, man. I appreciate everything you're doing for the community and, uh, keep, keep, keep up the, the hard work cause I know people need it. Thanks a lot, brother. Hey, man. Thank you so much. Mm-hmm. We'll speak soon. All righty. Ciao.